Good evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We Dare Squad, I can count on you all to be in the house. <laughs> good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shantae Charles. This is an evening edition of Daring Dialogues. I want to thank you all for your cooperation with allowing me to come and serve you uh, our Daring Dialogue for today in the evening time. Um, I tried to pick a time that was not hopefully uh, interfering too much with people's schedules um, or Bible studies that they may, may have going on this evening, um, but I wanted to make sure that I stayed on course, so I decided to do an evening edition. We are back in the book, Black First, and as you can see my tabs, I've got a few things picked out for us, um, and then we're going to be done with this book. And then we are going to get back into our discussion on immigration. And it is so interesting what we're going to read tonight because it's literally like we are reliving history right now. So incredible. All right. So we're going to be talking immigration. And a word to remember in terms of immigration is the word nativist. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Nativists are people who oppose immigration by any other ethnic group they consider themselves to be the real americans all right and so these people oppose immigration by any other ethnic group that they have decided is not american enough okay um couple of uh announcements if you have not i generally do not really purchase magazines but because of the record-breaking, history-making Black Panther, I decided that I was going to grab this issue of Essence. They have another um, cover with the women from the movie on the front. Um, but I encourage you to grab a copy of this particular issue. <laughs> Let me say that as a caveat. So that you can read up on the story of producing the film, the actors, the writers, and those kinds of things. So if you are interested in the arts, if you are interested in doing something that is history making, if you're interested in being inspired by the story surrounding that, then pick up March's copy of Essence Magazine. All right. That's my plug on that. And, um... I've been working on a journal. I haven't decided what I'm gonna probably put in here yet. I may just do um, all of my writings concerning race and race relations and then turn it into a book. I haven't decided yet because I have a lot of stuff that I've started to write um, concerning the topic of race and race relations in my personal journey. Um, but I think that I'm going to transfer it into one particular journal. So what I did, for those of y'all who are creatives and you're saying, man, because I was actually looking for a journal that was large enough and I was looking for a journal that maybe had a theme to it already so I could just start writing in that, but I couldn't find one. So what did I do? I got some stickers and I got something that you can get at probably any bookstore really. Um, and that is the insert for refills this is actually a journal refill it's acid free paper and i got some stickers related to my topic and i decided to design my own cover so as you can see that it is that it's an iconic picture of a slave demanding freedom all right and it's already got it's already got a ribbon to it and it is lined paper all right so i couldn't find what i wanted so i said you know what let me just use the skills i have and create my own all right so you aren't going to find a journal like this because i add, i added the uh details and i may do some ink drawing around this just as time goes on 
And then on the back, I have a quote that says from uh, Frederick Douglass that says, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. So um, this is kind of one of my favorite quotes from him. Knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. And when a person uh, knows the truth, right, the truth can set you free. It's impossible to really enslave a person who knows who they are and knows where they're going. All right. So just a little um, artsy project. And then I have, excuse me, another journal that is simply for drawing. I actually found this um, at Barnes and Nobles and it was like two bucks and I was like okay this is this is a good deal um, but anyway it is for those of you all who are creatives again and you want to improve your skill set it's got everyday kinds of activities for you to do to improve your skill set all right and to keep yourself sharp so I have been doing more so painting and working with um, acrylic paint more so than pencil. So I wanted to get back into pencil sketching and drawing just to make sure that I keep my skill up. And this is an excellent journal that you can do that in. It's called Just Draw One Thing Today. And it's already got uh, prompts in it where you can draw something every single day or you can do like me and work through a couple of them at, at a time. All right. But it just provides some daily structure for those of you who are, again, creative. All right. I think that is all my announcements. Yes. So let's get into Black First. Black First. And um, I'm going to backtrack. We had started talking about Black First and religion. We're going to come back to that. Um, but I wanted to backtrack because I missed a few that I meant to read to you all last time. So this is in the area of business. And this is the first black company on the stock exchange. The first black company on the stock exchange. In 1971, Johnson Products became the first black firm listed on a major stock exchange when it was listed on the American Stock Exchange or the ASE. The firm was founded by George Ellis Johnson Sr. in 1954. Johnson was the first black elected a director of the Board of Commonwealth Edison in 1971. He was born in Richton, Mississippi to sharecroppers. He relocated to Chicago with his mother and attended Wendell Phillips High School until he was forced to drop out to help support his family. He joined Fuller Products and later became a production chemist developing hair relaxer for men. In 1954, Johnson borrowed $250 from a finance company to establish Johnson Products. Later, he and his wife turned the company into a multi-million dollar enterprise known for innovations in the beauty care products industry. In the mid-1980s, he lost the company in a divorce settlement. All right. Um, also, this is in business. 1999, Radio 1. Most of us are familiar with Radio 1 now. Um, they Radio 1 produced the Roland Martin Show, which was very, very popular on social media, which I think they're rebooting it, I believe. Um, but right now, Roland Martin is doing his own show in the interim. But Radio 1 was founded by Catherine Kathy Hughes. And I actually saw her give an interview about a part of her story. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think that part of her story is in here, but I'll tell you if it's not, all right? She is still living. She was born in 1947. She became the first company headed by a black woman to be traded on the stock exchange. The company which went public May, 1999, was the largest black owned and operated broadcast company in America, owning 26 stations. According to a, risk, a recent NAMME report, the network now has 62 stations 
and a current value of more than $2 billion. All of this growth has taken place since founder Hughes bought her first station in Washington, D.C. in 1980. The network has stations in Los Angeles, Detroit, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and over a dozen more major cities. But at last report had yet to tap Chicago and New York. Radio One concentrates on an urban-oriented format, offering a blend of music and talk. Um, Hugh's son, Alfred Liggins III, took over as CEO in 1999 after having managed the day-to-day operations since 1994. Hughes herself became chairperson of the board. The company targets its broadcast to primarily African-American audience and has more than a thousand African-American employees. Its urban oriented format, however, gives it some crossover appeal. Radio One is recognized for a strong community involvement. Further growth is anticipated. And it's not in here, but I remember watching an interview of Kathy Hughes and her talking about her dream and um, her dream of owning and how there was a point in her life where she was homeless and she was actually staying in, I think, one of the one of the studios. So I find it very interesting that a lot of people who wind up being successful have seemed to have gone through what I call the pit of homelessness. They've actually passed through that made it through that and gotten to the other side and wind up being very, very, very successful people. So if you are feeling like you are in a pit, I'm just going to tell you to keep on passing through. God will get you out. I'm a witness. My husband and I are witnesses. All right. And the maestro, Mr. Charles, is in the house tonight. (laughs) So... 363, let's go there. This happens to deal with locations and has to deal, this particular one has to deal with Florida. I want to make sure people knew this if you did not know. Um, 1565, 1565, St. Augustine, Florida. This city is the center of the Spanish Florida colony and it is the first permanent dwelling place for blacks in the present territory of the United States. It had both slaves and free blacks from its beginning. All right. I know a lot of people were talking about that people would escape to go to, um, to Canada and up North, but believe it or not, people were also escaping and going South to Florida and they were going past Florida to go to Haiti. All right. So some people went north for freedom and some people actually went south for freedom, which is something that is actually not talked about in a lot of history books. So I want to make sure you knew that. All right. Moving on. Moving on. We're going to jump into beauty industry, the beauty industry. All right. 1995, Tyson Beckford, Tyson Beckford. He became the first black man to model in advertisements for Ralph Lauren and the first black to sign an exclusive contract with the company. He became the world's first black male supermodel. He was born in New York City to Jamaican parents. He left for Jamaica soon after he was born. When he was seven years old, the family returned to New York and settled in Harlem. His mother's experience as a part-time model helped him to get his start. She realized his extraordinary charisma and took him along to runway shows. Around 1993, a reporter for an influential journal photographed him. He soon became the, he soon came to the attention of Beth Ann Hardison, who had her own modeling agency and also took the lead in demanding more work for black models. Beckford's career took off in 1993 when he posed for Source Magazine and appeared in such publications as British GQ, EM, Essence, and Vibe. He appeared in fashion shows for Tommy Hilfiger, Nautica, Calvin Klein, Donna Karan, and others. All right, so he was the first black Supermodel, male. 
Here's another one. Sports Illustrated's first black cover model. Some of you may know this. Um, the first black woman to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated high profile swimsuit issue was supermodel Tyra Banks. Banks was born on, La on, Los, An on Los Angeles in Los Angeles and began her modeling career in Paris, France in 1991. She left Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles two days before classes started. Now that's some faith. To accept an offer to model in the Fall Hope Couture shows in Paris. There she was booked for 25 shows, then a record for a newcomer. Banks later landed several lucrative deals, including the Sports Illustrated assignment and a multi-page advertising campaign for American designer Ralph Lauren. Cosmetics giant CoverGirl hired her, making her the second black to receive a long-term contract with that company. Banks appeared in a number of television shows, including uh, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Her film credits also include Higher Learning. She later promoted a line of greeting cards for children and families. Another line, Cards from the Heart, was created by young children. She uses them to promote literacy among children in troubled environments. Pretty, pretty cool. All right, moving right along. We're gonna jump again to government. <clears throat> 1806, 1806. A child named Thomas was the first black child born at the White House in 1806. He was born to slave parents, Fanny and Eddie. The property, let me say that one more time, the property of President Thomas Jefferson. He, the child died, unfortunately, two days later. Jefferson's grandson, also named Thomas, was the first child born there. 1850, a black chef, possibly Hiram Thomas Bennett, was reputed to have introduced potato chips in America. It has also been claimed that an American Indian, George Crumb, made the first potato chips in 1853. They were called Saratoga potato chips. Another claim is made on behalf of a locally famous cook, Catherine A. Wicks, she is said to have introduced them at Moon's Clubhouse in Saratoga, Saratoga Lake, New York. And lastly, 1862, the first time a United States president addressed an exclusively black audience was on August 14th, when guess who showed up? Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, he had to be assassinated, clearly. <laughs> When Abraham Lincoln invited a committee of blacks to come to the White House, later, Lincoln was criticized for offering as a solution to the U.S. racial problem the immigration of blacks to Africa or Central America. But this was not a new idea. There were blacks, and we're going to talk about it shortly, who were trying to go, to back, go, to, go back to Africa. They were already trying, so it wasn't new what he was suggesting, all right? But he was the first United States president ever to address or to address an exclusively black audience. Tick some people off, it did, I know. All right, let's move on to the pioneer, which goes right into what I just stated, and that is in 1811, a gentleman by the name of Paul Cuffey, C-U-F-F-E, Paul Cuffey, led the first group of blacks to investigate resettlement in Sierra Leone. He transported 38 blacks there in the first systematic attempt to repatriate blacks from the United States back to Africa. This was in 1811, all right? Moving right along. Getting through these pretty fast, which is good. All right. <laughs> doop de doop. Here we go. 
Now we are back in religion. Oh, religion. 1792. 1792. Andrew Bryan is his name. Born 1737 and lived until 1812. Andrew Bryan began to erect the first African Baptist church building in Savannah, Georgia. We've actually been to this church. It's a beautiful, beautifully preserved sanctuary. If you have the opportunity to go to Savannah, make sure you stop by the first African Baptist church. The first building built for the purpose of black worship in the city. It was finished in 1794. Brian was a slave who refused to give up his mission in spite of whipping and imprisonment for preaching, which goes back to what we've already talked about, that if people were using slavery, I mean, using Christianity to enslave people, then why were people getting whooped and imprisoned for preaching? I just want y'all to put that in your head, wrap your, wrap your mind around that, why would you beat me for something that if I read it was supposed to enslave me? That doesn't make sense. Hello? <laughs> All right. He had formed his church on January 20th, 1788. The lot on which the church stood remained in the church's possession until at least 1913. The Black Baptist Church in Savannah was established before there was a White Baptist Church as was also the case in Petersburg, Virginia. Brian was born a slave near Charleston, South Carolina in Goose Creek. Sometime before 1790, Brown purchased his freedom. Around 1773 or 1774, he may have come in contact with George Lyle when Lyle preached on the Brampton Plantation where Brian lived last before he became free. Brian was baptized in 1782 and began preaching about nine months later. He also learned to read around this time. In 1788, a white minister from Georgia, Abraham Marshall, ordained him. Brian and his supporters preached in cells on plantations, either in the open or clandestine, depending on the disposition of the plantation owners. Now, why would they have to preach in secret if they were preaching a gospel that would enslave. Nobody has answers to my questions. I, I haven't gotten an answer yet. All right. But I just want you to think about that. The oldest surviving black church. The African meeting house built in 1806 and known as the Joy Street Baptist Church in Boston, Massachusetts, is the oldest surviving building constructed to serve as a black church. It housed the first black Baptist congregation in Boston, organized in 1805 by Thomas Paul Sr. It was also who also founded the Abyssinian Baptist Church in New York City in 1809. On January 6, 1832, William Lloyd Garrison organized the Anti-Slavery Society in the church basement with the participation of prominent church members. So for all the people out there who are running their mouths talking about how the church kept people enslaved, I'm going to need them to pick up a history book. Ma'am and sir, I sentence you to the library to go read. And let the church say, amen. <laughs> All right, moving along. More history for you. 35 CE, 35 CE. They estimate this to be roughly about two to three years after Christ's death. Um, this is the first person identified as a black convert to Christianity. The first person identified as a black convert to Christianity out of Africa, not the New World, not the United States of America, okay? 35 CE, the first person identified as a black convert to Christianity, not by force, but by choice. Not under a sword, but by hands lifted up and surrendered 
to God was the unnamed Nubian eunuch who was the treasurer of Candace. Uh huh. Either the queen mother or a queen who was ruling in her own right at the time. This man was converted by Philip the deacon. That is the earliest recorded known conversion of a black person to Christianity was in Africa. Again, I sent it to you to a library to go read. I'm just, I just love history. You, I, I, I don't understand. I don't think people understand how important it is to know historical fact. <laughs> All right. Not just Facebook memes. That's why we're doing this. Historical facts. Okay. 583. Let's look at this. 1920. 1920. The militant claim that blacks were Ethiopians who would fulfill a biblical prophecy to return to their homeland. Now, some people get upset about people saying blacks are Hebrew when there's actually evidence of that too. Not all blacks, but there are enough of them here in the United States that yes, some of them are when they do their African ancestry, AfricanAncestry.com for those of y'all who want to go do that. All right. They're tracing their roots and finding out that, yes, indeed, some of the black Americans here in the United States can trace their roots back to the African Hebrews, such as the Limba in South Africa. Another name that you can go reach research. All right. But they were saying this in 1920. In 1920, the militant claimed that blacks were Ethiopians who would fulfill a biblical prophecy to return to their homeland first received national attention when, when Grover Cleveland Redding set an American flag afire during a parade by his movement in Chicago. Whites tried to intervene and the ensuing struggle left two persons dead. Redding's associate in founding the group was a gentleman by the name of R.D. Jonas. That was in 1920. All right. Faith healing. I know people think that that is new. Faith healing. 1860s to 1870s. A lady by the name of Elizabeth Mix, who had been healed of tuberculosis, became the nation's first black healing evangelist, not Benny Hinn, Elizabeth Mix, M-I-X. Mix was so well respected for her accomplishments that doctors sent their patients to her for prayer. Sip on that, just sip on that. Just put a little drink icon up there, all right? She had been healed under the ministry of Ethan O. Allen, who in 1846 became the first American to associate Christian perfection with divine healing. He too had been healed of tuberculosis while in his late twenties and later became the first American to practice faith healing ministry full time. On February 27, 1879, Mix offered prayer to Carrie Judd, an invalid white woman from Buffalo, New York. Within a few months, Judd was healed and told her story in the Buffalo Commercial Advertiser in 1880. Judd became a prominent Pentecostal as a minister, teacher, writer, and social worker in Oakland, California. Mix, who was a Baptist, married a Baptist minister and lived in Wolcottville, Connecticut. Faith Healing, Elizabeth Mix. Have you, have you heard of her? Let's put some mix in the, in the current gospel. All right. Moving on. <laughs> Judaism and black Judaism. Again, most people think that this movement started in the 1950s and 1960s, but let's look at historical fact. Again, 1886. 
six. All right. So you're talking maybe what? Civil War ended 1860s, 1865. So you're talking about 20 years after that. A gentleman by the name of F.S. Cherry, a widely traveled seaman and railroad worker, founded in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Church of the Living God, the pillar ground of truth of all nations, the Black Jews, 1886. It is the oldest known Black Jewish sect. Although little is known about the church, it is known that Cherry moved the group to Philadelphia. According to Cherry, God called him to found a church and let the world know that blacks were the true descendants of the biblical Hebrews. In his view, God, Jesus, Adam, and Eve were black. He believed that whites descended from the servant Gehazi, whom the prophet Elisha cursed with skin white as snow. He preached that white Jews were interlopers and frauds. In 1896, William S. Crowdy, a cook on the Santa Fe Railroad, founded a church with similar views. The Church of God and Saints of Christ in Lawrence, Kansas. The church mixes Judaism, Christianity, and black nationalism and is sometimes called the first black Jewish group. Crowdy claimed, that also, claimed also that God called him to lead his people to identity and historic religion that were truly theirs. A principal belief is that blacks are the direct descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. Like Cherry, Crowdy also moved his church to Philadelphia, but relocated in 1905 to Belleville, Virginia, in, Nan in Nansmond County near Portsmouth. After that, branches of the church were established in cities throughout the country and overseas. Crowdy's church used rituals and symbols adopted from Jewish practices. Like the Jewish church, the Crowdy's church circumcised newborn boys, adopted the Jewish calendar, required men to wear skull caps, observed Saturday as the Sabbath, and celebrated Passover. They blended these rituals with Christian practices, such as foot washing and consecration of bread and water as Christ's blood. The first black Jewish sect in New York City arose in 1899 when Leon Richlow, or Richelau, established the Moorish Zionist Temple in Brooklyn. And most people have, I think most people have heard of the Moorish Science Temple, all right? The Moorish Zionist Temple in Brooklyn. This group emphasized a Jewish ideology rather than nationalism and seems to have included some white Jewish members, all right? So those were some of the starts of the black Hebrew movement in the 1800s, all right? The original Hebrew Israelite nation. In 1968, the original Hebrew Israelite nation, also known as Abeda Hebrew Cultural Center, became the first black American Jewish group to actually leave the United States and migrate to Israel. Formed in the 1960s by Ami Carter, the group was at first unsuccessful in establishing itself in Liberia and changed its goal to Israel. Some 1,500 members now live communally today in Israel, and they left in the 60s. All right? I'm going to keep it going. Let's move on. Pentecostals. Dun, da, da, dun. Pentecostals. And this book actually covers, it doesn't just cover the ones I'm covering. Um, it covers everybody, literally everybody. But I don't have time to read everyone, so I'm covering some of the main ones. All right. 1906, Pentecostals. From April 14th, 1906, the preaching of William Joseph Seymour at the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles began one major strand in the diffusion of the Pentecostal movement among blacks and whites. The first widely influential revival to emphasize the centrality of speaking in tongues as evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It drew both black and white. C.H. Mason's experiences at Azusa Street Mission in 1907 led him to make the practice central in the Church of God in Christ. 
1908, G.B. Cashwell introduced the practice he had learned from Seymour to the predominantly white Church of God, USA. Pentecostalists soon split along racial lines. C.H. Mason's church was incorporated, however, and some white leaders of segregated congregations continued to be ordained by Mason for a few years or so, so that they would legally be recognized as ministers. Seymour was born in Centerville, Louisiana. Little is known about his early life, but early on he claimed to have had several visions of God. He became a waiter in an Indianapolis hotel about 1880 and attended a local predominantly white Methodist Episcopal church. He moved to Cincinnati in 1900, where he was induced to join a revivalist holiness group known as the Evening Lights Saints. This was a predominantly black offshoot of the Church of God in Anderson, Indiana. Seymour had an attack of smallpox that blinded him in one eye, and after that, he decided to become an itinerant preacher. The Church of God ordained him in 1902. He wandered as an evangelist from 1903 forward, traveling through Chicago, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas. He settled in Houston and in the summer of 1905, and during her absence, he replaced the female holiness preacher, Lucy Farrow. On her return, Farrow, who had experience speaking in tongues, convinced Seymour of its importance. In 1906, he relocated to Los Angeles, where he led a prayer group in a house on Bunny Bray Avenue. Members of the group began speaking in tongues in the spring of 1906. On April 14th, Seymour held his first service at the Azusa Street Mission. The revival at the mission was at its height between 1906 and 1909, attracting widespread attention in the United States and abroad and serving as a catalyst for the Pentecostal movement. Ladies and gentlemen, William Seymour. All right. 601. Rastafarians, 1935. Rastafarians. Haile Selassie I was crowned Emperor of Ethiopia 19, in 1935, the approximate date of the founding of the Rastafarian movement in Jamaica. The coronation of Selassie seemed to fulfill a 1927 prophecy by Marcus Garvey that the crowning of a king in Africa would be a sign that the end of black oppression by whites was near. Since about 1960, the group in the United States has grown to an estimated three to 5,000. Now we know that that is a definite underestimation, all right? But that's what they have here in the book. So um, before Haile Selassie I, there was King Melanick I and King Melanick II. All three of these men are in, delet, are in, excuse me, are in direct line to Solomon and the throne of David. So go look them up and see what they look like. And you tell me their genetic line. All right, I'm going to keep going. Trying to get make sure I get through this book. Do, 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 do. Science in Medicine, Space. I want to make sure I point her out. 1987, Mae Jameson, or Mae Jemison, was named the first black woman astronaut on September 12, 1992. She boarded the space shuttle Endeavor as a science mission specialist on the historic eight day flight. Jemison left the National Aeronautic and Space Administration in 1993 and founded a private firm, the Jemison Group. The firm specializes in projects that integrate science issues into design, development, and implementation, implementation excuse me, of technologies. She also became professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth College and directs the Jemison Institute for Advancing Technology in Developing Countries. Jemison was born in Decatur, Alabama, moved to Chicago with her family when she was three, graduated from Stanford University in 1977, with a degree in chemical engineering and Afro-American studies. 
Jemison received her medical degree from Cornell Medical School in 1981. She worked as a staff physician for the Peace Corps for two and a half years in Sierra Leone. We've got just a few more and then we're hitting our topic on immigration. All right. Where is it? This is in the section of sports. Sports. 2012. Everybody was wondering, what was the big deal about Gabby Douglas? Gabrielle Douglas. Gabrielle Gabby Christina Victoria Douglas. 16-year-old gymnastic phenomenon and a member of the U.S. women's gymnastics team at the 2012 Summer Olympics held in London became the first African-American to win a gold medal in the women's all-around final competition. She is also the third straight American to win the women's um, gymnastics biggest prize at the Olympics. Gabby came away with two gold medals as the and her fierce five teammates won team gold two nights earlier. The Flying Squirrel, as she is also nicknamed, was allowed to leave her mother, two sisters, and brother in Virginia Beach, Virginia, to live with the host family and train with her new coach, Liang Chow, in Des Moines, Iowa. After winning the competition, she said, I hope that I inspire people. I want to inspire them. My mother said that you can inspire a nation. Gabby is the youngest daughter of parents Natalie and Timothy Hawkins. So she was uh, the all-around champ, and she took the women's all gold in all-around. Gabby also left Virginia because of the racism in Virginia. At her particular place that she was training, she was not being given, where are my three words, she was not being given education, proper education, access, and opportunity. So she didn't let that stop her. She found another coach and left all of her family to go train and live with that coach in Iowa so that she could be her best, so that she could make history. Because when people don't give you these three things, you, that, you don't let that stop you. All right, so let's learn from Gabby on that. Moving right along. Writing, my favorite subject, one of them. 1836, 1836. The first autobiography of an American black woman was the life and religious experiences of Jarena Lee, a colored lady. And we know that Jarena Lee was actually a preacher. She was a, she was a lot of firsts, okay? She was a religious leader. She was a 19th century evangelist and itinerant preacher who called herself the first female preacher of the first African Methodist Episcopal Church. In her lifetime, she published two autobiographies. The second, Religious Experiences and Journal of Jarena Lee, was published in 1849. Little is known about her life after that time. All right. History, 1836. Robert Benjamin Lewis is the first black to publish a history, which was called Light and Truth. Practically nothing is known about Lewis except that he was a native of Boston and had both black and Indian ancestors. Characterized by a remarkable disregard for any standard of evidence, the book tries, among other things, to create a black presence in history and... dun dun dun, dun to establish Native Americans as the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. I'm going to just let that marinate because he wasn't the only one that wrote about that, by the way. Um, one of the Mormon historians actually wrote on it too. But the Mormons have conveniently uh, got rid of that part of their writings where their own writers were talking about how the Native Americans um, bore lots of resemblance to the tribes and some of their practices and, and parts of their language. 
You can do a little research on that for yourself. Moving right along, nonfiction, 1742. The first dissertation written by an African slave was a thesis on slavery by the former slave, Jacobus Elisa Johannes Capetian, 1717 to 1747. It was also the first scholarly work by an African slave. Capetian's master took him from Guinea to Holland in 1928 and freed him. After that, grants from the wealthy enabled him to receive an education at the University of Leiden. Capetian returned to Guinea as a missionary. His work refutes the authors of antiquity and shows that slavery violated principles of natural freedom and equality. He also rebuts Aristotle's doctrine of natural slavery. Hmm. Why would it be important to make, why would it be important to put out a history in schools for black children that doesn't include any of the first that I just gave you? That's a rhetorical question. Just think on it. Why would it be important to think that nobody, no slave could read, no slave could write, no slave was telling their own story, no slave was publishing books or any of this? Why would that be important for children to think? Say la. 1970, Maya Angelou, birth name Marguerite Johnson, published I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings and became the first black woman to have a nonfiction work on the bestseller list. 1991, I actually have this book. Authors Dennis Kimbrough and Napoleon Hill published the first black self-help book. The first one, 1991, and it's called Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. The work quickly formed an audience and found an audience selling some 50,000 copies over the next two years. The book went through three printings in 1992 and 1993. It was a bestseller among black nonfiction titles. Hill wrote a 100 page manuscript that Kimbrough used as a base, but expanded to include many of America's most successful black people. He interviewed such prominent people as Alice Walker, Leontine Price, Earl Graves, and John H. Johnson, and added his own comments about success building. This was the first black self-help book specifically dealing with black people about wealth. All right. And lastly, do, 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 do. where are we? 1976, Octavia Butler became the first black woman science fiction writer to be published. Butler was born in Pasadena, California, grew up in a racially integrated community. She suffered from unrecognized dyslexia, the consequence of which at first led to poor performance in school. However, her problem never f interfered with the fantasy stories and romance that she wrote when she was 10 and 11 years old. After graduating from high school, Butler worked during the day and enrolled in fiction writing courses at Pasadena City College at night. After completing the two-year program, she studied for a while at California State College. By now, seriously interested in writing, she enrolled in writing courses at the University of California at Los Angeles, attended writing workshops by the Writers Guild of America, and participated in the Clarion Writers Workshop in Pennsylvania. Butler has published a number of short stories, several of which were award-winning. She also wrote a number of science fiction novels, most falling within a series. Her most successful standalone novel is Kindred, which she called grim fantasy and not science fiction, for there is no science in it, as she says. All right. So, excellent book to pick up, especially if you want to educate your child on 
the accomplishments of black people in the United States and their influence on the world. This is the latest edition that they have, which is the third edition. Hopefully, they will come out with a fourth one that includes up to at least 2016. All right. Immigration. If you all will give me an extra 10 minutes, we will try to knock out a good deal of this particular chapter. And I have some images to show you as well. All right. So, again, we're talking about the nativists. The nativists are those who oppose immigration by any other ethnic group. Remember, the nativists were, all right, they were those who considered themselves to be those who were German, Irish, Welsh, Scots, French, Swiss, Scandinavian, Dutch, and Belgium. All right. By this point in time, they have decided that they are American enough. And so anybody else coming in is going to have a problem. We left off by talking about how nativists were not waiting for immigrants to become successful. By the 1880s, more and more Americans began to call for limits on their number. The Chinese Exclusion Act became law in 1882. At the same time in Philadelphia, the National Home Labor League was founded to preserve the American labor law, the American labor market for American working men. All right. In New England, the American Economic Association announced a $150 prize for the best essay that you could write on the evil effects of unrestricted immigration. The Haymarket Riots of 1886 called attention to foreign agitators with radical ideas about giving workers more power and changing American democracy. Americans later feared radicals from Russia and Italy. Hmm. <laughs> but it was in the 1890s that a new era in immigration policy began. This was the era of Ellis Island, the entry point in New York Harbor, which for many is along with the Statue of Liberty, the, the symbol of immigration to America. In fact, Ellis Island, which opened in 1892, came fairly late in the story of immigration. It was also for many of the immigrants who passed through a place of fear as well as hope because with new government policies, they could be sent back to Europe without ever entering the United States. In 1882, that law was updated by the 1891 Immigration Act. The list of restricted persons began to grow larger. So who were they starting to restrict at this particular point? Let's see. Remember, it included people convicted of a crime. Um, it included polygamists. People with more than one spouse were restricted from coming into the country. Um, any person whose ticket or passage is paid for with the money of another who was assisted by others to come. Because for them, that meant you can't afford to stay here. If somebody else bought your way in. All right. The last would be immigrants who signed contracts to work before they came to the United States. This had been illegal since 1885. Its purpose was to keep out cheap labor that took jobs from Americans, but also to protect immigrants who signed unfair contracts without knowing they might actually get a better job once they came to the United States. The steamships that transported immigrants to the United States had to immediately take anyone who was rejected back to the port they had come from. Steamship companies had to pay a fine if they knowingly transported a person who was barred from entering the country. An immigrant who became a public charge within one year of his or her arrival could also be deported under certain conditions. So if you were here and one year you still couldn't make it, and you became what they call a public charge, 
or a person um, that the public now had to pay for and worry about, you too were deported. In 1891, this act also created a new government job, National Superintendent of Immigration. Immigration, which had been supervised by individual states, would be in the hands now of federal government. Not every immigrant had to pass through Ellis Island. All those who came by steerage did. Those who traveled in second class or first class did not have to be inspected because what was the thought? Obviously, if, if we felt that you could afford first class, then we thought that you could afford to be here. Because they had enough money, they could land immediately in the city and begin their lives in the United States. John Derobian came through steerage. When he was 16, he immigrated from Armenia. What are they going to do to us on Ellen, Ellis Island, he worried. Many, many of our people were sent back. Some people were sent back. Some people were sent back because they couldn't speak right. Some were sent back because they were sick. There was always something. I'm worrying. Will this thing work? What are we going to do? Will I get in? Will I get a job? Can I work? We got to Ellis Island and thank God we didn't encounter any trouble. Faye Lunsky was only five years old when her family immigrated from Russia in 1893. They were escaping pogroms. Government supported campaigns to persecute and kill the Jews. So... Now, we have an issue where we have a government, South Africa, saying we're going to take farmland from the white South Africans that has been lying dormant, and we're going to redistribute that land. Now we have people wanting them to come over because they feel like they're being persecuted. These are some of the images from Ellis Island as they are checking in. Um, this is a children's playground on the roof of an Ellis Island building. For those of you all who can see that. All right. So they're going through inspections. And again, if you were in first class or second class over on the ship, you didn't have to go through inspection. <clears throat> The child remembers, Faye Lunsky remembers, she caught the measles on the steamship. So when we landed at Ellis Island, I was separated from my mother. They took me to the hospital where they kept those that were detained, and it was very frightening. I didn't know the language, and I didn't know what happened to my mother. She was finally allowed to join her family. Most immigrants expected the United States to be America, the promised land. Nuggets of gold hanging on Christmas trees, diamonds on the ground, <laughs> sparkling pearls in crystal water, begging to be held by human hands. Remember Walter Lindstrom, who immigrated from Sweden in 1913. But Lunsky pointed out, my mother said, there's an expression in Europe, America, the golden land. She comes here and says, where's the gold? <laughs> Oh, yeah. America, the golden land. Where's the gold? She saw people struggling and it was a letdown for her. But as soon as he was able to, my father became a citizen and he would go and vote. He was jack of all trades. He got any job he could and he struggled. It was very rough, but he made it on his own. Hard work was a way of life for most immigrants. Not only men, but wives and children as well had jobs. We started work at 7.30 in the morning, and during the busy season, we worked until 9 in the evening. Recall Pauline Newman, who came as a small child from Lithuania in 1901. She soon worked in a dressmaking factory in New York. They didn't pay you any overtime, and they didn't give you anything for supper money. Sometimes they give you a little apple pie if you had to work very late. That was all. What I had to do was not really very difficult, continued Newman. It was just monotonous. When the blouses were finished at the sewing machine, there were threads that were left, and all the children, we had a corner on the floor that resembled a kindergarten. 
We were given little scissors to cut the threads off. It wasn't heavy work, but it was monotonous because you did the same thing. Children, like Newman, were below the legal age for working. When city inspectors came to the factory, they hid them in boxes. Many Americans did not understand how much effort immigrants put in to be successful in the United States. Instead, they saw the immigrants lived in poor, crowded, dirty conditions. In many tenements, there was only one toilet on each floor, and there were no windows in most of the rooms. Water had to be fetched from the yard. Four, six, or eight people might sleep in one room and not on beds. It was no wonder that they and their children had tattered clothes and shoes and that they caught diseases like tuberculosis. And of course, they continued to speak their own language. But immigrants supported each other. I remember we always had somebody living with us, said Lunsky, who grew up in Boston. One person brought over somebody else. It was an uncle or a cousin. They had no place to go. There was always room, even if it was on the floor. We were close with our neighbors. If anybody was sick, they would bring chicken soup. Some Americans worked to improve immigrant living conditions. Settlement houses, community centers where social workers aided poor people in the city, helped new immigrants to find jobs, learn about health care, and they provided safe places for children to play. But their main goal was to Americanize immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe as quickly as possible. We've got to Americanize you. All right. They had to Americanize them as quickly as possible. They offered classes in English and how to be a good American, which meant giving up foreign customs and languages. They encouraged immigrants to quickly become citizens. So what is it? What does it mean to be Americanized? It means to give up your culture and customs. And when you do not do that, you get looked down upon. Mm -hmm. But other Americans and their voices began to grow stronger. They believed that the solution to fighting slums, crime and poverty was to severely restrict ethnic groups such as Italians, Jews, Poles, and Hungarians from entering the United States. Nativists began to use what they believed were scientific arguments to support their calls for restriction. Anthropologists had begun to group people based on their physical characteristics, including skin color, size, and shape of the head. A new system of classification based on how people looked divided Europeans into Nordic, Alpine, and Mediterranean categories. Nordics came from Northern Europe and of course England, and they were supposedly superior to Alpines from Central Europe, and even more superior to Mediterraneans from countries like Italy, Greece, and Spain. This way of thinking associated physical traits with culture. People with lighter skin had superior cultures and values. These are things that we're not making up. This is actually how people actually thought. This is what they were writing about. This is what they were putting together in their sciences. So when people talk about this term, all right, when people talk about colorism, we have to understand colorism was coming from these kinds of policies. All right, people with lighter skin were said to have superior culture and superior value. And you can actually still see that flowing through our society today. Nativists also use theories of biology incorrectly to support their claims. Charles Darwin had proposed that animals and plants evolved, grew and changed over thousands of years. Animal and plant species that inherited the strongest traits from the preceding generations would be able better to survive. 
Americans speaking out against open immigration believe that poverty, crime, illiteracy, and other social ills did not grow out of limited economic and cultural opportunities. They believed that these were inherited characteristics. Therefore, the children of the Southern or Eastern European parents would have no choice but to live in poverty. Understand what I just said. They believed that these were inherited traits and as such could not be fixed. All right. If you understand that these things come out of opportunity, lack of opportunity, then they can be fixed. But if you're saying that poverty and crime and illiteracy comes out of an inherited characteristic, then you think that those people are quote unquote born that way and therefore they have no choice but to live in poverty. That they would never become acceptable Americans. This was the thinking. The hereditary character of pauperism and crime is the most fearful element with which society has to contend, asserted, asserted a social worker. Prescott F. Hall, a founder of Immigration Restriction League in 1894, asked if Americans wanted their country to be peopled or populated by British, German, and Scandinavian stock, historically free, energetic, progressive, or by the Slavs, the Latin and Asiatic Jewish races, historically downtrodden and stagnant. Nativists worried that Anglo-Saxons or Nordics, as they began to be called, would marry and have children with Southern and Eastern Europeans and Jews. These children will be weaker and less successful than pure Anglo-Saxons. These new immigrants threatened to smother and obliterate American predominance American influence and American ideas and institutions, one nativist society said in the 1890s. So as we close, I want to show you all this visual. All right, we'll come back to the end of this chapter next week, but I wanna close by showing you this visual. Take a look at that visual, all right? And as you can see up there, they've actually kind of carved and sculpted some faces that is supposed to represent different kinds of people that were coming into the country. And they were actually using models like this to determine who they felt was superior by their physicality, by their physical features. Anthropologists working in the late 1800s and early 1900s defined different ethnic groups by their typical physical characteristics. These heads actually represented types of people from various countries and they were sculpted to decorate the Library of Congress building. Think about that, all right? So as we close today, one thing that we, we need to understand about this issue of immigration is that people are using some of the same kinds of arguments that they were using in the 1800s. They have resurrected those arguments. They've drugged them back up and they're now spouting out the same kind of generational ignorance that was back then. All right. And we don't want to be those people. We don't want to be the person saying, oh, your nose is too wide. I don't think you should be in America or your skin is too dark. I don't think you have a place here in our society. So um, hopefully you got something out of today's message. This has been another Daring Dialogues and I have been your host. I hope that you will be the light where you are. Understand uh, what is necessary and understand the things that we're talking about here on Periscope, the things that we're talking about through the, the YouTube broadcast, that these are issues that are still facing our country today because somebody has not learned from the past and someone has chosen to take ignorance and pass it on to the next generation. That's why we keep hearing it. 
That's why we keep seeing it perpetuated. Someone has not learned from the past. <laughs> All right. And they're perpetuating things that were debunked. But now those things, again, are being trotted out to determine whether a person should be in this country or not. All right. I want to thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for giving me some extra time tonight. I hope that you all have had a great and wonderful day. Take care. And we will be back tomorrow with our Wednesday where we are talking about relationships. And remember, we are starting um, a new book on dating and the history of dating. So you want to make sure that you tune in for that, especially those of you who are interested in purpose-filled relationships. All right. Tune in tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Take care and God bless. Thank you for joining me.